Good morning, First Richardson. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? We're going to sing and celebrate Jesus. So good to see you. Hello to our friends watching online today. When we're going to sing and lift our voice to our King. You lift your voice. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. Hallelujah Oh, heaven comes to fight for me I 
Will somebody praise Jesus this morning? He's worthy. Our King is alive. He is a living King. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to church, church family. So, good day. Busy day, right? Lots going on. So, my name is Jason Canaday. Um, have the opportunity to serve with the students, get to be a greeter. This kind of reminds me of my regeneration recovery days. I struggle from people pleasing. And, but, all right, different, different story. So, as you guys walked in, you should have received a bulletin. If you didn't, we can get you one. On one side is the Connect card. So, if you have any interest, desire to be connected with, fill that card out and we can get with you. On the other side is a prayer card. We all have stuff going on. So if you, if you need prayer, I believe in prayer, fill this out. It gets prayed over on Tuesday mornings, gets prayed over by the staff. So that's on that side of the bulletin. So here's the scoop. Good morning and thanks for being here today. I'm Pam Connor. I'm part of the Media and Adults Ministry Team, and I'm excited to tell you about an upcoming event, Friendsgiving. Join us for dinner, followed by Family Feud, hosted by our very own Ronnie and Robin Marriott. It's gonna be a blast. And trust me, the gloves, they're gonna come off for this one, literally. We'll be collecting new gloves to donate to the Network of Community Ministries. While this event is hosted by the Media and Adults, it's open to all ages. Just text GATHERING to register. We've got more exciting opportunities in the 55 plus ministry. Young at Heart is a monthly event filled with entertainment and a delicious lunch. It's a great time for fun, food, and fellowship, with the next gathering being November 21st. And if you're in a mood for a holiday adventure, travel with Tracy to enjoy Christmas in Branson. It's not too late to join the trip. You can grab a brochure at the welcome desk or text Branson to sign up. And kids, don't forget, next Sunday is time change, and that means it's PJs and Pop-Tarts time. Wear your pajamas to church, and we'll have Pop-Tarts waiting for you in your Sunday morning groups. As we enter the holiday season, many of us look for ways to focus our gratitude and support those in need. Our prayer team has put together these thankfulness calendars with reminders for the month of November. Head over to the tables by the Next Steps room to get yours today. Starting later this week, we'll be kicking off Angel Tree and November for Network. Through Angel Tree, we partner with Cornerstone Ministries to bring Christmas joy to families facing difficult circumstances. If you or someone in our church family is experiencing a tough season, please don't hesitate to reach out confidentially to Ron Evans, our missions pastor, by texting JOY. Throughout November, we'll also be supporting the Network of Community Ministries to fill their shelves. You can help by bringing food items to church next week and dropping them off in the crates in the lobby. If you're short on time, you can make a financial donation and we'll handle the shopping for you. If you have any questions, feel free to stop by the mission wall after worship. Okay, that is the scoop for today. So as we go into the offering prayer, um, your generosity matters. We uh, not only not only outside in the community with Bear Fest, which was awesome. Who took part in Bear Fest? Yeah, it was awesome, uh, Northridge Elementary. But also here inside of our church to help to help our own too. So, with that being said, I'll bring up my brother Matt. Good morning. If everybody would uh, pray with me, please. Father God, we thank you. Uh, what a beautiful morning and a beautiful time of year and just to help us to, to, to rest and, and, and just uh, enjoy the blessings of your creation and your presence. Thank you, Lord, for being here in this room with us this morning and everywhere we go. Um, I thank you for the freedom to be here to proclaim your Lordship in our lives and to gather together. Father, as we move into the offertory <clears throat> time, I just... Uh, you know, know that you are almighty and don't need us, but joy and take joy in our obedience. And I just pray you'd stir our hearts uh, to generosity in your abundance, Lord, with our time, talents, and resources. And I pray that 
this, this, uh, these uh, resources that are collected this morning would be uh, magnified and multiplied to your glory. Bless us, Lord. Stir our hearts in this, in this service this morning, and, and I just pray for your blessings on our uh, uh, Sunday school hour and Bible fellowship hour and uh, the time on the plaza. Thank you, Lord. It's a beautiful day, and uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship this morning. Come on, let's sing. You are mine at the highest. You are mine at the I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Through the sun sets free. Oh, his free in me. I'm a child. Declare with hope. He died for me. The sun sets free. Oh, his free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place.
praise you. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Come on, let's join with heaven this morning as we sing. Oh, praise. Sing, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Then on the third at break of dawn the son of heaven rose again oh trample death where is your sting the angels roar for Christ our King Church, the blazing sun yes. shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Thank you, Jesus. We look to you. We look to you, the author and finisher of our faith this morning. Only you are faithful. Only you are proven worthy. Lord, be glorified, be magnified in this place, be enthroned upon the praises of your people this morning, as your scripture tells us. Look to you, Jesus. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your presence in this place this morning. Draw us to you by your mercy. Your name is the 
thank you that that isn't just lyrics on a screen this morning. God, our Father, it is true. You are always holy forever. You're always reliable. You're always trustworthy. So we, your people this morning, by worshiping in song and now by worshiping as we hear the proclamation of the written word, look to you with hope, longingly. We need you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said Amen, amen. You may be seated.
Good morning, First Richardson. How are you guys doing? Yeah? Great. All right. Yeah. Must have some uh, Red Raider fans in the room. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah. Hey, uh, glad that you're here. I, I know that you've been welcomed already. I want to extend that welcome to you. We're so grateful that you are here. Uh, and also something you saw on our Scoop video, you were encouraged uh, to like, uh, comment, share uh, things from our social media posts at church. I, I want to encourage you to do that when you see that, to, to make a positive comment, uh, to like it, to share it, wh whatever. Uh, this is one easy way for us to get the word out about what God is doing here in our church. And so it's a very easy thing to do. It's a very low cost thing for us to do. And so you can really help spread the word of what God's doing here uh, by sharing that. Social media, I know there's debate and discussions and there's ills and all the things that go with that, but it truly can be a game changer for our church uh, of letting people know and, and getting people to, to come here and, and be a part of what is going on. Uh, so you guys have had uh, Sam down here for a couple of weeks. Uh, we love him, right? Yes? Thank you, Sam, for coming. Uh, you know, hiring, hiring Sam down, a friend of mine, uh, is truly a game changer for our modern worship service. Uh, so we're grateful. Even for those who are in celebration service, I hope they come over and get a chance to meet Sam from time to time. Those of you joining us online, I hope you'll come on campus and get to meet Sam. Uh, really, hiring him has been a, a, a game changer for all of us. So um, you've heard that term, game changer, right? It's kind of popular now today, and it kind of came out of the sports world. Right? Game changer is when an individual or, or maybe a team did some, something spectacular or something that kind of changed the trajectory or the course of the game. Typically taking a team from the L column to the W column, from losing the game to actually winning the game, there's a game-changing moment that, that happens in, in a game. So we've kind of adopted that phrase, talking about not just sports, but er other areas of life. Uh, I was reminded of uh, an event that happened back in 1964, before most of us were actually born. Right? So Ronald Reagan gave a speech. Barry Goldwater was running for president. And so Ronald Reagan gave a speech talking about a time to change. And that was kind of the focus of his speech because he wanted to help get Barry Goldwater elected as the president. Well, it was a great speech. It didn't cause Goldwater to win, but it was memorable. So memorable, people started paying attention to this guy named Ronald Reagan. He had no really political clout whatsoever at that point. But people started to notice, they were impressed by his speech and what he did. And so actually, the Republican Party started to form groups about electing Reagan in different states. Eventually, he, was became, he became the governor of California, and then in 1981, he became the 40th president of the United States. That speech that he gave, not even on his behalf, but somebody else's behalf, was a game changer for him. I thought about another event that happened back in 1978 with a 15-year-old sophomore boy who tried out for his varsity basketball team at Laney High School. And his coach cut him because he said he was too short, he was too slow, and he was too lazy. To which his dad echoed the same thing. He was the laziest kid I ever knew. Right? So he was cut at 15 years old from the basketball team. But that fired him up. That, that event, it didn't defeat him or deflate him. It actually motivated him. So that summer, during the offseason, he worked to get bigger. He worked to grow taller. He had a bar hanging in his backyard. He would go out and hang on the bar in his backyard to try to get taller. His grandmother told him, if you will put salt in your shoes, it'll make you taller. He put salt in his shoes. He tried everything he could. And that summer, between his sophomore and junior year, he grew from 5'10 to 6'7. And he began to work on his skills. Eventually, he played basketball for North Carolina, taking them to an NCAA championship. And then Michael Jordan was adopted, was drafted by the Chicago Bulls and led them to six world championships NBA championships. That was a game changer for Michael. He got cut from the varsity basketball team because he was too slow, too short, too lazy. So rather than be defeated, it motivated him, and he probably, in my estimation, the ba best basketball player of all times. So that motivated him. Another story, you guys probably know Steve Jobs, uh, if you have a computer or an iPhone or something from Apple, right? So Steve Jobs quit college. And I'm not saying that's a good thing to do. <laughs> right? I'm not saying that's for everybody. But he wanted to take classes that he enjoyed. He had a hard time finding things that he enjoyed. 
So one of the classes he took was a calligraphy class where he learns about Sanskrit and different, different typefaces, which didn't mean much in his life then. It didn't have a lot of impact. But 10 years later, he started, built a Microsoft computer. And he started there, and he used what he had learned 10 years before to adopt a new way of writing, a new way of typing, a new format. And so he took what he had learned, and it impacted him in such a way, and of course, we all are connected to Steve Jobs in some way, that at the time of his death, he was worth $10 billion. Leaving college to go pursue something he enjoyed was a game changer for him. Well, again, so game changers are not just for sports. They happen in all of our life. Most likely, those of us in the room would say we had a game-changing moment when someone cared about us enough to share how much Jesus loved us and what Jesus did for us. And for us, that was a game-changer for our life. Or maybe for you, it was, it was when you finally asked that good-looking girl out for a date. Right? You finally got up enough nerve to ask her out. You've been wanting to for months. You finally did, and now she's your wife, and you've been married for a number of years. Or maybe it was someone or something that somebody said that inspired you in such a way it changed your course of life. That was true for me in going into ministry with a student pastor. They just, just spoke into my life, and it changed my whole course of action. So we all have these game-changing moments. And if you understand that concept, you're going to be able to relate to chapter 3 of Habakkuk. Because for Habakkuk, his game-changing moment was when he looked around and saw all the injustice all the pain and all the oppression that were going on among God's people. And he cries out to the Lord. And he cries out to God for answers and get him to respond. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to open to Habakkuk chapter 3. And the, the two questions we're going to deal with today is, first of all, like Habakkuk, when you find yourself in a crisis, in a situation you don't understand or don't like, and you cry out to the Lord, would you be honest enough to say that maybe you desire deliverance from the trial more than you desire the one who will walk through the trial with you? It's oftentimes our prayer, God, get me out of this. But is that the right prayer? Do we desire getting out of the trial rather than knowing the one who will take us through the trial? Do we desire God to move, remove the difficulties from our life more than we want to know the one who can get us through difficult times and will be there with us? I think that's a sobering question, especially if you find yourself in a crisis right now. Are we more concerned with changing our circumstances than really getting to know the one who can change circumstances or get us through circumstances in a deeper way? I think this was a crisis of faith Habakkuk was going through because he sees the sin of the people around him. And that's, that's the issue about sin. Sin causes us to focus on ourselves. What can I do to change the situation? What can I do to bring healing or forgiveness? What can I do to fix myself? We're, we're big into self-help these days. But the problem is we can't fix the problem because typically we are the problem. It is our own sin and rebellion that has led us to this condition. Now, sin is not all, I mean, pain and suffering is not always a result of sin. Sometimes we just suffer, sometimes physically, emotionally. We suffer, and it's not a result of sin, but oftentimes it is a result of our own sin. And Habakkuk looked at his people and God's people and realized the reason they're in this situation is because of their rebellion against God. They begin to serve and follow other gods. They became very culturally minded so much that it embraced them and overwhelmed their way of thinking, that they began to leave thinking about God and thinking about these false gods, and so they were suffering because of this. But the good news and the good news of the gospel is that we are not worthy. Christ, Jesus, desired a relationship with us. So he became our sin. He became our evil, our wickedness. He became all of that so that he could die and remove the power of that in our lives. That's the good news of the gospel, how much Jesus loves us. So that we can be filled with peace, not fear. And even though we still sin, we know that we've been set free from the power of sin and the punishment and the penalty of sin. And we can actually grow and be stronger in our faith and execute our faith in a different way. So look at Habakkuk 3. Just want to look at the first two verses. A prayer of the prophet Habakkuk according to Shiganoath. Lord, I have heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years. So the first step that we see in Habakkuk, instead of worrying, he focuses on the facts. He says to God, I have heard the reports about you. 
I've heard the stories of the past about you. And through that, he gains confidence. Through, through that understanding of what God has done in the past, though he can't see God moving in the present, he knows the God of the past, and that gives him confidence. And not only confidence, it really begins to change his perspective. He wrestles with this perception of God. He knows the character of God. He, he knows God and the past histories of God. But what he sees in the present, it seems like God is absent. That's a crisis of faith. We, we all struggle with that from time to time. God, where are you in the midst of this pain and suffering? Where are you in the midst of all this stuff we see in the world? And so we have to rely on what we do know about God, the facts that we do know about him. So what we see happening in chapter 3 is God is moving from Habakkuk from worry to all the circumstances that he sees to worship. He's moving from worry to worship, which is exactly what God wants to do for us. I mean, the Bible says don't worry, but let's be honest, we worry. <laughs> There's some things that freak us out, that stress us out, because we don't have control over it. So we begin to worry. The Bible says don't worry. Well, come on, that's a pipe dream. There's no way. But if we can replace worry with worship, it starts to change that. Maybe not change our circumstances, but change how we handle it and how we see that. So chapter 3 of Habakkuk is actually his prayer, but his prayer is written to music. This is actually a prayer song that Habakkuk writes. If you can imagine music playing in the background, much like an intense scene in a movie, it begins to build towards a crescendo at the end, and it's, it's just building and building and building, kind of like the Jaws theme, right? Just building and building and building getting towards the point as he prays and he, his mind begins to change, his perspective begins to change. In fact, this prayer was a song to be sung. The Jews sang it three times. The first time they sang this song was when they were kind of hiding out in the temple as the Babylonians were come to capture them. The second time this song was sung was during exile when they wondered, was God ever going to rescue them? Was God even hearing their prayers? They sung this song to remind them of the stories of God's goodness in the past. And then the third time it was sung was after God did restore the people of Israel after 70 years of exile back to Jerusalem. So this song had significance throughout this difficult journey of 70 years of exile. Yet it brought confidence and hope in God's people. In fact, verse 2 really is a demonstration of how you and I as Christians should respond to the Lord in times of crisis, in times of struggle, or times of doubt. I have heard the report about you. I remember the past in my life where you have shown yourself to me, where you have revealed yourself, first of all, to invite you into a relationship, and then from that point forward, every time, how God reveals himself to us. This is a powerful response to crisis because the truth is the devil is our enemy, and he is very good at leading us to focus on our circumstances, focus on our problems, taking our eyes off of God, forgetting God's character, forgetting God's faithfulness and focusing on our issues. When we focus on our suffering, sometimes it's easy to start to doubt that God is actually loving. If we're going through these personal issues, these struggles, then maybe God isn't as loving as I thought he was. Personal suffering, if you ever cried out to God, why me, can cause you to doubt that God really cares about you. Doubt that God actually has a plan for you. The devil wants to focus our thoughts that way. Or persecution, oppression from those who consider us their enemies can cause us to doubt that God really is in control. The circumstances we find ourselves in. So what Habakkuk encourages us to do is to look from a spiritual viewpoint. Remember the passage, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us are guilty of sin Yet in God's grace and mercy, he sent his son to take our place, to give us hope and life and peace and joy now. We don't have to wait till heaven. It'll be magnified there, but we can experience it now regardless of circumstances. We're not bound by our circumstances. We have the Holy Spirit of God living in us and encouraging us. Martin Lord Jones said this, the holiness of God and the sin of man are the only two things that matter. When we feel the pressure or the guilt of realizing that we still sin, that's when it's so important to, to focus on the majesty of our God. That our God is bigger than any sin we can commit. He is able to forgive, He is able to cleanse, and He is able to heal. And this gets us through and helps us to 
times of struggle to see his glory. So Habakkuk begins to focus on the facts about God. And then he asks him to do it again. <laughs> right? As a church at First Richardson, we, we can look back to the past, a glorious past of over 150 years of existence. In the time during the 80s when this church moved out here and things were, were booming and, and God was using this church in a powerful way. And we can ask God, do it again. God, in our country, we've seen you move before. Do it again. We need a spiritual awakening. God, do it again. It, it's okay to ask those questions and ask those requests of God. It may look different. He may do it in a different way, but he can still do it again. Right? He can revive us. He can use his church to make an impact in the world. And so we pray these prayers. The God of our past is the God of our present. He's the God of our future. So what he did back then, he can do again, and he will do in the future. So hopefully this gives us confidence and assurance to press on even in difficult times. So Habakkuk begins to change his perspective and begins to change his prayer. When he focused on the Babylonians and the prophecy that God said in 20 years, the Babylonians are going to come and oppress the Jews and send them to exile, he began to worry. But when he started to think about the holiness of God and the justice of God, his worry began to disappear. Because God is holy and God is just. His ways are always right, whether we understand them or like them or not. He is good and he is right. So Habakkuk started to focus on that. And he stopped pro protesting against God allowing the Babylonians to come. He stopped asking God to stop the Babylonians from coming to oppress his people. He doesn't even ask for God to change his mind about what he's going to do to the Jews. But he begins to focus he was in an attitude of complete submission to God. Maybe not liking what God's will was, but trusting that God's will was best, even for the people of God. So he focuses on glory of God and nothing else. He stopped thinking about the Babylonians and all their evil wickedness. He stopped thinking about the Israelites and how they had left God and rebelled and abandoned him. And he started to focus on God and nothing else and the glory of God, and that began to change his perspective. So in Habakkuk 2.20, back we talked about this last week, he said, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. It doesn't matter what happens on this planet. God is still God. He is still in charge. He is still sovereign. He is still on his throne. And he still has a plan. And he's invited you to be a part of that plan. That will never change. God's invitation and God's love for us. Look at verse 3. God comes from Temna, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His brilliance is like light. Rays are flashing from his hand. This is where his power is hidden. Plague goes before him, and pestilence follows in his steps. He stands and shakes the earth. He looks and startles the nations. The age-old mountains break apart. The ancient hills sink down. His pathways are ancient. I see the tent of Kushan in distress, the tent curtains of the land in Midian tremble. Are you angry at the rivers, Lord? Is your wrath against the rivers or is your rage against the sea? When you ride on horses, your victorious chariot. You can hear the music building behind all of this. You took the sheath from your bow. The arrows are ready to be used with an oath. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains you see in shudder. And downpour of water sweeps by. The deep roars with its voice and lifts waves high. Sun and moon stand still in their lofty residence at the flash of your flying arrows, at the brightness of your shining spear. You march across the earth with indignation. You trample down the nations in wrath. You come out to save your people, to save your anointed. You crush the leader of the house of the wicked and strip him from the foot to the neck. You pierce his head with his own spears. His warriors storm out to scatter us, gloating as if ready to secretly devour the weak. You tread the sea with your horses, stirring up the vast water. What is he doing here? He's reminding himself of the stories of the past, of how God dealt with Israel, how God saved them, how God provided for them, how God protected them, how God crushed their enemies. And he's asking God, do that again. There are times in stress we've got to go back to remember the stories of where God showed himself faithful to us. This is what he's doing. This is why, that's why I love the Old Testament, to go back and see where God was faithful and God was gracious in the Old Testament. and the New Testament, we see God has come to us in the flesh to dwell among us. 
All of this, all these stories help me to face the difficulty that I'm going through. So the second thing Habakkuk does, instead of worrying, he reads stories of the greatness of God's power and reminds himself that our God is all powerful. All these stories of the past demonstrate that God saves those who look to him, that God saves those who cry out to him. God is not deaf to our prayers. He's not ignorant of our suffering. And God saves. Our God saves. And the God who makes promises is powerful enough to fulfill them. As crazy as they might sound, he is powerful enough to fulfill every one of his promises. All these stories demonstrate that. They also tell us that the God of the Bible can act whenever he wants and however he wants. His ways are right. There is no one more powerful than our God. I don't know if you struggle with this idea of God punishing sinners. I don't know if you struggle with the issue of heaven and hell. And that God disciplines those that he loves and God punishes those that rebel against him. I mean, I've struggled with that idea too. But then I look at the cross and I'm reminded that God provided an answer for all of this. He provided an answer out of rebellion, out of separation from him. When Jesus came to the cross and he died for our sins and he made a way for us to have a relationship, God's sinless son took my sin upon himself so that I can be made righteous. That's who my God is. That's who the God of the Bible is. And we can look at the cross to demonstrate that. The cross of Jesus shows God in in his frightening majesty, that our God is a God of love. His kingdom is a kingdom of unity and a kingdom of love. And we all want to be loved. We all want to be loved. We all want to know that the God of the universe, who knows everything we do, that every sin, every evil thought we've ever thought, loves us unconditionally. That brings peace and that brings healing. God allows his people to suffer. If you read through the other prophets, You see, that Israel will suffer by the Babylonians. But all of that is to bring about a greater glory. God allows suffering in our lives to bring about a greater glory. God always redeems what he allows. And it's all for a greater glory for his glory. We see that in nature, right? You know how they purify gold? They have to go through intense fire so it can burn all the way. All the things that are not gold burns it away. We see this in nature with diamonds. You know how diamonds are formed? With intense pressure. (laughs) It's intense pressure with suffering, but a diamond is produced. We see it in the plant world, right? In just a few months, many of us will be pruning back our trees so they can produce more fruit or produce more flowers or more vegetation. It's painful. Pruning is painful. But it's for a greater purpose. It's for a greater glory. It's Necessary, the same in our lives. Pruning is necessary. The pressure that we feel is necessary. Going through the fire is necessary. But what we rely on the goodness of our God, He doesn't take us out too early and He doesn't leave us in too long. His timing is always right, His timing is always perfect. Through Jesus' death, we get life. His suffering gives us life. His death produces life. Look at verse 16. I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. Now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there's no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the field produces no food, Though the flocks disappear from the pen and there are no herds in the stalls, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord of my salvation. The Lord, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. And then here we see the evidence that this was a song for the choir director on stringed instruments. A song to be sung, a song to be played. But this is his response in the end. Instead of worshiping, he worships the God who can rescue him. Instead of worrying, he worships the God who can rescue him. So if you're worrying right now, maybe it's, it's time for you to start worshiping the God who can rescue you 
and who will rescue. That's his promise. Habakkuk demonstrates how looking back and remembering how God works on our behalf to bring about good for his name, but it produces joy in our life. And joy for the Christian is not the absence of pain and suffering. It's a state that we're in in the midst of pain and suffering. It's not the removal of negative circumstances. It's in the middle of those circumstances we can experience joy because of our God. The truth is when we're frightened, we can't just manufacture faith, right? Some of us are suffering right now, and the tendency is to, to manufacture faith, make everybody think I've got it together, even though people know we're suffering, but hey, I, I got this. That, that's not real faith. Our faith is strengthened when we allow our hearts and our minds to be filled with the truth about God, remembering that God saves his people and remembering how God saves his people. Our faith has to be fed. Our faith needs to be fed on these stories of God's goodness. Habakkuk fed his soul with prayer. I think what he gives us here in the end is really the sign of real spiritual maturity. He started praying this prayer, God, do this for me. Change your mind. But now his prayer is do whatever you will, and whatever you will, I will rejoice regardless. May it be not what I want, but whatever you choose to do, God, as sovereign Lord over all things, I will rejoice, even if it brings pain and suffering in my life. It's a different mindset. It's a whole different attitude. He moved from crying out to God to get him to do something for him to acknowledging his power, acknowledging God's sovereignty. He says, even if all this happens, I will trust in you to give me the strength to get through, to persevere through this difficult time. Even if you bring the Babylonians, I will trust in you to provide the strength that I need to get through this storm. The same God that Habakkuk cries to is the one that we cry to today. Because I hope you know when you became a Christian that accepting to be a disciple of Christ meant you had to sacrifice everything. Just as Jesus sacrificed everything on the cross, when he says, you must take up your cross and follow me, the cross is an instrument of torture. It's not a tattoo. It's not a necklace. It's not artwork. It's an instrument of torture. When Jesus said that, they knew what the cross meant, the pain and suffering. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, it's not a symbol it's dying to self. That's what's required. But we know when we die to self, that allows the God of the universe who loves us to work his plan in our lives. And that plan is more glorious than anything you and I could ever manufacture. We have to sacrifice and lay down our lives for him. When I was studying this passage, I was reminding of the group Casting Crowns. I don't know if you've heard of them before, but they wrote a great song called Praise You in the Storm. And I just want to read part of the lyrics to that song. He writes, I was sure by now, God, you had, would have reached down and wiped our tears away, stepped in and saved the day. But once again, I say amen. That it's still raining as the thunder rolls. I barely hear your whisper through the rain. I'm with you. And as your mercy falls, I raise my hands in praise. The God who gives and takes away. And I'll praise you in the storm, and I will lift my hands that you are who you are, no matter where I am. And every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in the storm. The truth is, you and I don't have to be strong. <laughs> our sovereign Lord is our strength, He fights our battles for us. Martin Lord Jones said this, the moment we become really concerned about the state of our soul, instead of our affliction, we're on the high road to God's blessing. I think a sign of spiritual maturity is when we can say as Christians with confidence and security and sincerity that I can praise you in the storm, that I will praise you in the storm. That's a sign that we are maturing in our faith and understanding in a deep way the goodness of our God. So this morning, I want to challenge all of us to ask this question. Is there anything in my life right now that warrants the Lord's discipline? 
Is there any sin that I'm hanging on to? Anything, any attitude, any behavior that I'm hanging on to that deserves God's discipline to remove that from me? Ask him what it is because God has given a great solution to our sin. We can confess and repent. 1 John 1, 9, if we're faithful to confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all the guilt and all the pain and all the suffering. This is the goodness of our God. It's a game changer. God is a game changer in our lives. This past week, we've been praying for the lost. We've been praying for game changes in their lives. People that we know that are far from God, that don't have a relationship with God. Prayer is a game changer. In fact, we have a shirt that says that, right? Prayer changes everything. Praying for the lost is a game changer. So this morning, just a minute, I wanna invite you to come down to the front in both rooms, to come down to the front. You have cards with names on them that you've been praying for. Don't stop praying until God saves them. But just a minute, we're all gonna come down the front. We're gonna have a mass prayer for these people. But then there's a next step I want you to take. When you leave the worship centers this morning, you're gonna get a card. It looks exactly like this one. It's an invitation card. If the people on your card, the people you've been praying for that don't have a relationship with God are close by and can get here, I want you to invite them with this card. But even if you don't know someone close by or you haven't been a part of the prayer week this week, I want you to take a card. Everybody's gonna get a card today because I want you armed with ammo because when you meet someone who doesn't have a church home, I want you to have a card to give them. It's got an invitation. It's got a QR code. You can find out more about our church. When you meet somebody, maybe somebody waiting at your table, maybe at the grocery store, the gas station, on the sports field, or maybe in your classroom, hey, I'd like to invite you to my church. I want you to have this card with you. And I want you to give it away. And when you give it away, we've got more. If you don't give it away, it, it turns to worms and causes havoc in your life, right? It doesn't do any good setting in your pocket. But it can do a whole lot of good. It could be a game changer for somebody's life. If somebody cared enough about them to invite them to their church. Very simple ask, right? You can do this. So right now in both rooms, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you to move to the front. We're all going to gather at the front and we're going to pray together. got plenty of room. Squeeze in tight. We love each other. And even if you didn't have a card, there's probably someone you know that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. Just think about that person right now. If you do have a card, just think about that. You don't even know who that person is, you just know their name. Just think about that name that you've been praying for this week. Or maybe God's put someone else on your heart. God responds to the prayers of his people. We believe God still saves. Amen. He still wants to save those people that he put on your heart and mind. He wants to save them. He died to set them free as much as he died to set us free. Prayer works. So I'm going to pray. We're going to just kind of, you can pray silently for that person on your heart or mind. And I'll pray over us together. Then Ron's coming to do the next steps. So stay right here. Don't go away yet. And don't forget a card to get a card when you leave. Let's pray. God, we recognize you as a God who saves. You are perfect. We are imperfect. We are flawed. We are broken. We are sinful. We are prideful. Father, there's a list of the sins that we commit on a regular basis. Yet, in your grace and your mercy, you became one of us. to save us from our sin and show us how to live in righteousness. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice to come down and live our life and to suffer. 
Though you were perfect, you became our sin. Every evil, wicked thing I've ever done, you became that. But you were innocent. I don't understand the depth of that kind of love, but I, I, I gratefully receive it. And God, you've told us in your word, you desire that no one perish, no one spend eternity away from you. And we know those people. You've put them on our heart and our mind. We're related to some of them. We work with some of them. We go to school with some of them. We see them at, a, at the restaurant, at the grocery store on a regular basis. And these are people made in your likeness that you died to save. Even the ones we don't understand and we don't agree with necessarily. But we know you love them. Help us to love them too, the way you do. And God, we know that you want to save people. We ask right now, today, that you would answer our prayers and you would save the peoples, the people that have been on our cards, been on our hearts, been on our minds, people you brought to our mind even today, that you would save them. Whether by us sharing the gospel or sharing our faith story or someone else. It takes an average of seven gospel conversations typically for someone to come to a relationship with you. We pray that you supersede all that right now. Save the people that are close and dear to us. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for using us, your church, to accomplish your will and advance your kingdom. We want to be mighty warriors for you. Pushing back the gates of hell, pushing back the darkness that so many people live in because we are people of light. May your light shine bright at First Richardson. As we leave here, it is our mission field to be your representatives. Help us to be the game changer in somebody's life. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. All right, come on up. Thank you for that, Ronnie. So um, I'm going to continue. We're going to sing some more, and I'm going to continue to be down here. And uh, maybe, maybe you're somebody in this room that uh, you were on a card at one time, or you're, you're on a card now that someone's praying for you. Maybe you're a visitor here, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'm going to be down front here as we, as we leave, and I'm going to be here. You can come talk to me, and I would love to tell you about my Jesus. And I promise you this, it'll be the most amazing thing you've ever done when you give your life over to Him. In addition to that, maybe, you, uh, maybe you've maybe you been coming here, maybe you know Jesus, you're not a member of our church. We want to help you to come and be in the body of, of this, this body of believers and to be in fellowship with us, become a member. We want to point you to our small groups, our discipleship groups, our Sunday school classes where you can get community and you can be closer together. And I want to take you on a mission trip with me. All right. So as we go, know that I'll be down here and uh, Ronnie and other pastors will be at the Next Steps room. So whatever's going on in your life, if you want us to pray with that, we'd love to pray with you. And continue this week to continue to pray for those that you prayed with for this morning. That our God, the same God that rescued us, would rescue them. Father, we praise you and we thank you. We thank you because you are the creator of all things. Your scripture says over and over again, you tell your disciples, disciples that all things that be given to you by your Father. And so Lord, we pray over these people that, that, we, that you have brought to our mind, that we have cards on these people, that Lord, that they would come to know you. And I pray that you remind us that we are a part of your process. And Lord, whatever is going on in our heart, we bring that to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for worship today. We would love to pray for you. Text the word pray to the church number and join us again next week in person or online.